Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. You can open up your Bibles. Uh, I'm just going to go. We're building this uh, truth. Um, and so I'm going to start around Ephesians 6. Um, in Ephesians, uh, actually, I'm going to go to James, all right? But we will come eventually to Ephesians. But I want to go to James first. You know, we've been talking about sowing the seed and God's Word. And I shared with you that things get stirred up when you start to apply the Word of God to your life. And I want you to understand that when you apply the Word of God to your life, things begin to sometimes get crazy. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain that. But I want you to know that it's our responsibility to plant the seed. And I, I shared with you over and over that that seed is God's Word. And that word is promises of God that you need for your life, and you plant them in your spirit, and faith rises up. Then once you believe that you receive that in the realm of the spirit, you believe that you receive that you're healed, you believe that you receive that you have strength, you believe you receive you have hope or whatever you need in your life, then I shared with you Satan has a right to hit you hard. He can come in and bruise your heel, to cause offense, to cause you to see if you stumble, to see if you really believe what you really believe. James said, count it all joy. I don't know how many times I've really counted the joy when something hits my life and spins it. Joy comes a little late. First, I respond emotionally, <laughs> sometimes negatively, but I have to adjust myself and count it all joy. So I just want to go on that. And James 4, we're talking about asking God for things out of a wrong spirit. I don't want to really get into that part of it. Because sometimes we ask God to heal us so we can go back to drinking. We ask God to heal us so we can go back to working. We ask God to heal us so we can go out and go fishing. <laughs> so, and sometimes we just ask God to do it for our selfish motives and it just ain't going to happen. Because uh, God has a purpose and a plan for everything that he does. He just doesn't do something just because of a whim of yours. God has a plan and a purpose. And your heart has to be towards him for it to begin to function that way. So we'll skip that part. He's talking about adulterers and adulterers. That's being friendship with the world. In other words, I want to gain prosperity so I can get rich and buy boats and planes and houses and go on trips and see the world and everything else. And see, God said, I've given you the power, the ability to make wealth to build my kingdom. And so sometimes we put ourselves uh, before God and he calls that adulterous, adultery. We know what it is in a natural when you make love to another woman than your wife, or you make love to a man that's not your husband. We get that. But do we really get that sometimes our asking for God for things is putting something before him and not putting him first? And just think of those things. Do you think the scripture says in vain, verse 5, the spirit that dwells in us lusts envy? But verse 6 is where I want to start. But he that gives more grace, wherefore he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves. That's a command. Submit. How do I submit to God? By sowing God's word into your spirit. By asking God to take over what you can't. Praying his will out in your life and not trying to work it out yourself. We'll see that in a moment. Then it goes on. Therefore, you see the word therefore, it's actually talking about what come prior. What was prior is that God gives grace unto the humble. Grace unto the humble. We'll look at that in a moment. And then it says, resist the devil. That's a command. You got to oppose what's coming against you. You are responsible to take authority over what's coming against you. It's your responsibility. God is not going to stop anything that comes into your life. You are responsible to recognize what the source or who is the source and then you got to recognize that you have authority through the word to stand against anything the enemy's bringing against you for example less is struggling with sickness and disease if he humbles himself and comes to the word of god and submits to it 
he finds that Jesus is his healer. And that he'll find that medicine and doctors can only go so far, but the initial healer is God himself. God is the healer. God provides the medicine. God provides the doctors. God provides the right person to be there at the right time. I remember there was another minister in the town that struggled with the same thing that I did, and he went to the same hospital that I did because back then it was called um, Hillary Clinton Care. I don't know if you know this. I'm dating myself. And now it's Obamacare. And Clinton Care, you could only go to the doctors in a 30-mile range. And so I had a horse doctor, I had an Amish doctor, and I had a sports doctor. And I have a pulmonology problem. <laughs> so I don't need a sports doctor. I don't need my knees straightened out. I don't need my shoulder worked on. I, I need. So he told me I, I was healed. And when I saw my x-ray, there was no lung. It was just a white cloud, completely gone. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, that's the normal course of pneumonia. And at home, every 15 probably minutes, I was puking into the seat, all this yellow chicken noodle soup. And, and Brenna would chase it down with a bottle of Clorox. And we, I was never sick. She was never sick. So we, we believed the doctor. So one Sunday morning, I said to her, this wasn't a sermon, but this is good. And so I said to, I said to Brenda, you do the pulpit, and I'm too sick. I, I, I couldn't even walk from here to the door. I'd pass out. And so I said, I don't know what to do. And so I'm going to go turn myself in the emergency room. I don't think I trust what the doctor's telling me. I'm not getting any better. This went on day after day after day after day. And so the doctor that was supposed to meet me there at 2 o'clock never showed up because they know they did me wrong. And so I'm sitting there, and they take away my, my jeans and my shirt and my socks and my shoes, and I'm sitting in my tidy whities back then. And they said to me, if you walk out, that's on you, brother. You can leave, but you've got to walk out in your undies. And so you're sick, and do you understand how sick you are? So I was admitted into the hospital, and they're going to do an emergency surgery on me. And a short story, they cut me from here all the way around, took out ribs, and they cut some of my lung out, and it was a painful surgery. <laughs> They had to go in there and scrape out bacteria and mold and virus and yeast. And there was five different things operating in my chest cavity. And the only thing that saved my life, the surgeon told me, was it popped a hole at the top of my lung. So everything that went up filled my lung. Instead of going to my next lung and get double pneumonia and die in my sleep, it would recycle in the same lung. God allowed a hole to recycle in the same lung. And so... Anyway, I'm in the hospital, and this guy shows up, and he says, uh, you don't know who I am, and I don't work for this hospital. I said, oh, oh yeah? And uh, we have faith going out. I was ministering. We were building a church. We had 100 and some people, about 150 people coming. It was rocking and rolling. We had a powerful ministry. We were moving in the things of the Spirit, seeing the things of the Spirit. And I didn't know these truths back then. That's why I'm teaching these with a passion. And I got hit by the enemy, and I went down. I'm 35 years old. They told me, in eight hours, if I don't get surgery, you'll be dead. And so I didn't have a choice. They didn't really give me a choice. And this man walks in, and he says, you don't know who I am. I'm from Michigan. I'm a heart doctor. But I heard about your situation. He said, would you mind? He said, I don't even know if I'll get a penny for what I'm going to do. But I'm intrigued, and I want to go in. This kind of surgery hasn't been done since they created antibiotics. <laughs> you couldn't tell what kind of doctors I went to. And so anyway, I said, sure. I said, I don't know. Yeah, that'll be fine. And so it was kind of interesting. This doctor, a heart doctor from Mid -Atlantic, Mid Midway Atlantic, it's a big heart uh, place that's coming into most hospitals today. And he was a starter of it. He was a heart surgeon. And God provided him for me. And he went in and saved my life. Amen. And he was there, just happened to be there that day that I happened to come in. And God let us meet each other. And I thank him still today for Dr. Lundy. Amen. Thank you for Dr. Lundy. Amen. And so God has things worked out. He'll, he'll help you, but you've got to submit to him. And things just happen. You don't understand why they happen. But the reason it hit me, because I'm sowing the seed, and I'm trying to share with you, when you start to apply the Word of God, when you start to move in the things of the Spirit, 
Satan has a right to bruise you. He has a right to come in and crush you. He has a right to try to destroy you. And so the Bible says here, he commands us, the Bible, Jesus, the Word of God, you have to resist the devil. I had to resist that sickness. I had to resist what was coming against me. God can't do anything unless we, by faith, confess the Word of God, put the Word to work. God's hands are tied. You got to resist the enemy. You got to oppose what the enemy's trying to do to, to kill and steal and destroy your life. This is, not, this is not a game. It's a spiritual force because when you step over into the realm of the Spirit and you begin to work out, walk out the Word of God by faith, the enemy is going to come immediately and hit your life with something and you need to recognize that. And I would recommend you to submit to the Word of God, find the Scripture that deals with your situation and begin to sow it in your seed. Now, what I didn't tell you about this, about a year and a half, I left the ministry. I came home and I told Brenda's dad, I'll never go into the ministry again. I'm really sorry for uh, being homeless about three times. We had no place to live. And so I come begging for him to let us live at the house. I had two children at that time. And I said, I promise I'll get a regular job. I won't do ministry. And it shocked me, but he said, well, why can't you do something in the ministry? And I'm saying, no, I'm embarrassing myself to you. I told you I'd take care of your daughter, and it's not working. <laughs> it's just disastrous. And so he encouraged me, but I got a job. Every day going to that job, he told me to study on healing. And I totally kept casting aside. Ah, no, I'm not reading the Word of God. I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I wouldn't say it was every day, but it was occasionally, frequently, he would deal with me about the spirit of healing. And I kept casting it aside. And a year and a half later, I got sick, and I had no faith. Because if I would have listened to the Spirit of God, if I would have submitted to the Spirit, if I would have humbled myself and listened to what my Spirit was telling me through the Holy Spirit to study healing scriptures, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. I would have had enough strength, enough faith to stand against what came against me. But I had no faith. I had to rely totally on Dr. Lundy to save my life because I had no faith at all. And you've got to understand that. If the Spirit of the Lord says to my spirit that if I'm dealing in a situation to your spirit, open your heart. Find those scriptures. Look into it. Peruse it. Study it. Examine it. Because coming down the pike is something that's going to be contrary to what I'm sharing with you to study. Know and understand the method of the realm of the Spirit. Know that Satan has a certain MO that he operates and functions in. But also know that my divine will also has a methodology to it. Faith is the way that I move. Faith is the way that I answer prayer. Faith is the way that I get and bring the glory of Christ into your life. Understand the way of the Spirit. Understand your enemy. Get to know and submit unto the Word of God. Submit unto me. Do not be prideful. Do not be proud and think you have everything in control, that you have everything under your hand, that you can provide everything you have. One day something might hit you. And what are you going to do? But if you submit to my Word and listen to my Spirit as I lead you and guide you and direct you, you will have faith to stand against the greatest war, greatest battle that shall enter into your life. So you must resist the devil then he'll flee from you. The word flee from there means he, he runs desperately from you. Listen to this. Satan will run desperately from you to find a place of hide, to find a place of rescue, to find a place to hide from you. Because of the power of the faith of God's word, when you stand up as the sword of the Spirit and use it, the enemy will run from you. But if you don't speak God's word, you don't have God's word in you, you haven't built faith into you, the enemy ain't going to leave you alone at all. He's going to continue to harass you. He's going to torment you. And he's going to continue to offend you and cause you to stumble because he has that right to do it. So let's look at some of that. Turn with me to 1 Peter 5. I love to hear what God's going to say through me. So now we'll get into the sermon. <laughs> but anyway, it's good anyway. And first. Chapter 5, Peter, 
just to go over this chapter, remember this is a letter and it's not a, a book of the Bible where it's cut down in chapters, verse. When it wrote, it was like a letter. When I wrote to Brenda when I was in prison, not proud of it, in jail, I didn't put chapter 1, verse 1. I love you, honey. <laughs> chapter 2, I miss you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Verse 3, I hope to get home soon. <laughs> so, anyway, I just wrote a letter to her and signed it. Your lovey hubby, you know, whatever. But anyway, I don't think I even said that. I'm not that kind of emotional guy. But anyway, he talks to the elders which are among you. I exhort you, an elder. He's talking about pastor, minister gifts. He talks about being there on the Mount Transfiguration. He saw the very glory of God come upon Jesus. And remember, he turned brighter than the sun. And Peter hit the dirt and says, Is it really good for us to be here, Lord? And then when the Lord told him it was okay, he said, Should we build three houses? One for the Spirit of God, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? <laughs> anyway, feed the flock of God. Remember he told him that? He returned to him when he was fishing. Over in John, he returns to him after he's resurrected. Peter denied him three times. We're going to look at this in a moment, so I don't want to get into it too deep. Jesus returns to him one day, and they were fishing. They went back to fishing. I went back to work. I went back to maintenance. I went back to work with my hands, what I was good at. And Peter went back to fishing. He was good at fishing. And so Jesus shows up and he says, Hey, you got anything to eat up there, boys? <laughs> and John, the one whom Jesus loved, <laughs> said, Hey, that's the Lord. And Peter threw on his robe and swam in when he recognized the voice of Jesus. After they eat together, so in heaven we're going to eat, thank God, and Jesus takes him to the side and says, Peter, do you love me? You know that I love you, Lord. Well, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? And the next feed is, Pastor, shepherd my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? And he got angry. Peter always got angry. He got frustrated. He said, Lord, only you know if I love you or not. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you torturing me? You know if I love you or not. And Peter, John, Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Verse 2, I have fed the flock of God. He obeyed God finally. But I want to show you something that happened to Peter before he became obedient. And I think sometimes we go through the battles of life. God permits them because he has to. Because when you step out of faith, if we don't understand that Satan has a right to hit us, he will hit hard and you better understand what's going on and not blame God. God did not cause that evil. Listen to our show on... Uh, Fact TV on last uh, Thursday he talks about some of this. <laughs> Which is among you taking the oversight, not by constraint, but willing. He didn't have to twist my arm to get him here this morning. Not for money. Trust me, in a ministry, it's hard to make money unless you have a good crowd, good people. Nor for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Not being lords, not being a shepherd that walks in shepherdism. I'm never going to tell you how to live your natural life, what to do with your natural life, where to work, who to marry, where to go. I'm not even going to ever answer you. I'm going to say, follow your spirit. Being examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd, which is Jesus, shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory. So he's talking about ministry here. Then he talks about young ministers. This is not age. This is when you came into the Lord and into ministry. He said, submit yourself and be subject to one another and clothe with humility. And, and, and James 4, 6, and here, God resists the proud. He's not talking to sinners here. He's talking to Christians. If you think you got your life all wrapped up and you don't need God in your life in any area of your life, watch out. Because that's the area the enemy's going to hit you. I was never sick. I didn't need God in my... And he talked... A year and a half he talked to me about Hill. I was never sick. The only thing I ever took was Tylenol for maybe a slight headache. I was never sick. It's amazing. So I didn't think I needed God in that area of my life. So where did I get hit? Where I had no faith. I mean, he hitched. The devil has a methodology to him that we need to get understand. He comes to kill still and destroy. Now let's go on. Notice here he gives grace to the humble. I want to talk about this. 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. That's the spirit of the living God. When you start to cast the seed of God into your spirit, you're humbling yourself under the hand of God because the spirit of God is going to take that seed that you're sowing into your spirit and he's going to begin to illuminate that word, that knowledge to your spirit because of your humbleness of coming to him to learn that truth, the spirit of God will begin to exalt you in that area. And I, I wrote some of this down. To exalt there means to enhance and honor. If I didn't get a hold of Dr. Lundy, I'd be dead today because the minister that went in with the same situation is kind of unique. He died. He never went out of the hospital. I enter in, and mine's even worse than his was, and they didn't know what to do with me. And thank God, God had a man there that knew what he was doing. Amen? Thank God. Because when I asked him to forgive me, and my wife wouldn't leave me. She even slept with me that night. They made a room for her. And she held my hand all night as they said I was dying. And I said, honey, I'm not dying. I don't sense that anyway. But there is my pride again. And so anyway, notice here, humble yourself. Put that seed in there. Keep putting that seed in there. You're humbling yourself under the Spirit of God. You, don't, you can't do everything on your own strength. You can't do everything. You're not Mr. Perfect, Mr. Mr. Universe, Mr. Olympic Man. There's weaknesses of you. You need to humble yourself. Put the Word of God in you. Keep putting the Word of God in you. Keep putting the Word. And He'll exalt you in due time. He'll honor you. He'll give you fame. And I believe it's coming. You watch. We're getting known in this region. People even open the door for me and my wife and greet us. Goes on position. He'll exalt you into position. You mean just studying the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God? He'll exalt you? Yeah, that's what He promises you. You spend time with God and put the Word of God into your spirit and spend time with Him every day, He's going to begin to exalt you under His hand. What does that mean? Honor, fame, position, power, and fortune. Isn't that good? It says here, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and He'll exalt you in due time. In His timing. In His timing. Then it goes on, casting all of your care upon Him, for He cares for you. So let's take cares. Something in your life is constantly battling your thought life. It's coming against you, and I, I think Paul, Peter knew that this would hit us, so he used cares. The first care here, it says casting all your care upon him, means anxiety, worries, or cares. Something that's burning you down. Something that's constantly speaking to your mind. Something that you can't get control of in your mind. It keeps speaking to you over and over and over. It's driving you nuts. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And he says, cast your care upon me. Cast it on him. And then it goes on, for he cares for you, and that's kind of interesting. That means he's going to be concerned for your interest. As long as you hold on to your sickness, as long as you work, hold on to your cares and worries and your situation, and you think you can work it out on your own, he'll let you. You've hogtied him. If you don't know what that means, on the farm, that's when we took the animals and we tied their feet and their and their their paws together. I was going to say hands and legs. <laughs> I don't know too many pigs with hands and feet. But anyway, we take their paws or whatever they are, hoofs, I guess. <laughs> I'm getting confused on my animals. And we'd hog tie them. They can't go anywhere. And so what you do when you don't humble yourself under the Word of God and put the Word of God in you, you think you're better than God. You're smarter than God. You're proud and you're prideful. Go for it. But know and understand this. If the enemy hits your life, do you have enough faith do you need God at that moment? If you do, He's going to be there, but He can't do much for you other than bring you back to the Word of God. And thank God sometimes for His mercy. Thank God for His mercy. Without Him, I wouldn't be alive today. Thank God for His mercy. I pleaded for His mercy. I asked Him to grant me life. And I shared with you after the surgery, I sat there for three days numb. What in the H happened to me? <laughs> Why this happen? I'm living right. I'm ministering. My church is at 150 people. I mean, we're rocking and rolling the things of the Spirit. I'm preaching the Word of God. We were having church five nights a week. 
We had prayer. We had Bible study. We had Sunday morning, Sunday night. We had Sunday school. We had youth night. I mean, we're moving in the things of the Word. But see, I never put the Word of God in me. And He hit me hard. And He has an interest for you. You have to cast that care onto Him. You have to cast that sickness on Him. How do I do that? By planting the Word of God into your spirit, finding Scripture to deal with your situation, and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you so I can get in, cast that seed, cast that Word of God, find the seed that you need, plant it into your spirit, and faith will rise. Now watch this. Be sober. What does that mean? Don't be drunk. <laughs> sober means to be well-balanced, to be self-controlled. Because when something hits your life and it twists you around in a circle, you get out of control. The language changes. Your attitude changes. Your situation changes. The way you treat people changes. You know what I mean? You know where I'm going. Then it says, also says, be filling. And all these are imperatives. All these are commands. You got to have an intention in your heart to apply the word of God to your situation. It says, diligent means being constant in readiness. Constant in readiness. There's 130 scriptures alone that teach you your inheritance in Christ. Are you in constant readiness of understanding who your inheritance is? Name me five of them right now. <laughs> then it goes on and it says this, because your adversary, not your friend, your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. Adversaries, one who is continuously antagonistic to another. In other words, Satan is always going to oppose and resist the will of God. He's going to constantly come against God's will and God's word. He's an adversary. Devil there means slander. It goes on here and it says... Walking about seeking whom he may devour. That's interesting. Who may he may destroy. Now, remember, I, I took you back to Job. I talked about this Thursday at Fact TV, but I'll go over it real quick here. In Job, remember, he, Satan comes and questions God's uh, protection around Job. And I don't know if you know this story or not. But Satan appears with the angels, and he goes in, and he begins uh, to plead his case to God. And, he, and in chapter 2, it's the same thing. And in this story, it shows you that God doesn't tempt anyone with evil. But what he does do, he allows the enemy to hit. And he told Satan, no, you have to do it. It's in your power. You do it. And notice what he took from from him, he was a multi-millionaire. This is before Abram. They say the scholars say Job lived before Abram. And so he's a very wealthy man of the East. And he had camels and he had sheep and he had children and he, and he had camels and he had all kinds of substance. When Satan comes in, he says, and answers the Lord, verse 7 of chapter 1, Satan answered the Lord saying, from going to and fro and earth, walking up and down. And in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, we don't see Satan changing his tactics. His M.O. is that he's always moving around to and fro to who is he going to destroy. He's not going to destroy somebody that's full of sin. They already have a nature of sin in them. They're already full of spiritual death. So who he's going to hit is those that want to walk in faith. Those that are righteous unto God. Those that love God and live for Him that's who Satan's walking about to see who he can destroy. And the Lord said unto us, Even as thou consider my servant Job, there's none like him, perfect and upright man. Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Does he respect you for nothing? You made a hedge around him. I can't even break it. I can't get on any side of him. You blessed him with so much prosperity and substance and you increased him in the land that I can't hurt him. Put forth, Satan says, now put forth your hand, your spirit, your anointing, and touch him, that he will curse you the faith. The Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that is in your power, in your ability, your mythology, you're the devil, you're the adversary, you're Satan, you're the thief, you come to kill, steal, and destroy, you're the murderer, you're the liar. 
Only upon himself, do not kill him. Whoa. And I saw something this morning. Hold on to that thought. He's walking around what? To kill, steal, and destroy. He's walking around what? To devour. Look what he begins to devour. There was a day his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine and their eldest brothers. There came a messenger. Your ox were plowing, your donkeys feeding beside them. The Sabaeans fell upon them and took away them. The slain, all the servants, weds of the sword, took everything from them. I'm only one able to scoop. Soon as he was done speaking, another one, the fire of God has fallen from heaven. Notice they called it God. He didn't understand there was an enemy. And has burned the sheep and the servants and consumed them. I'm the only one that lived. Then he goes on speaking. The Chaldeans fell on three bands, fell upon the camels, took them all away. I'm the only one to survive. While he's still speaking, another one enters and says, Your sons and daughters are eating and drinking, getting stoned in their house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, verse 19, and smote at the corners of the house and found upon the young man, and they're dead, and only I'm escaped. And here's where we get the wrong confession, the cliche that's wrong. Job here didn't understand there was a devil. He didn't understand there was an enemy to his soul. He didn't understand who Satan the devil was. So what's he say? God gives and God takes away. God don't take anything away. God's a giver. God so loved this, the world that he sent his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe should not perish but have an everlasting life. It didn't say, once I give you that life, I'll take it away and I'll put you in hell. That's just crazy. In chapter 2, again, Satan comes. And Satan, in verse 4, answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. I'm telling you what, you put a sickness, a disease upon him, and he'll curse you right to your face. What did the Lord say unto Satan? Verse 6, he's in your hand. I don't, I don't cause sickness, disease. I don't tempt any man. I don't put evil on anyone. Anything out of faith is evil. Anything not of faith is sin. God only works and moves by faith. Where's faith come by? Hearing and hearing the word of God. You've got to get the word of God into you so that you have faith. And then it goes on. I'm building up to some here. Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and he smote Job. Who did? Devil did. Devil don't give you cancer. God doesn't give you cancer. God doesn't break your arm. He said he's a better father than any father in the natural world. What would you think of Josiah sitting in our couch sleeping? And I said, you know what? He didn't pick up his toys. And I told him three times to pick up those toys. So I walk over and I grab his leg. And I snap right over my knee. That's going to teach him a lesson. In the natural, we'd say that's a bad father. That's child abuse. But it's amazing what we said God has done. <laughs> I mean, he's the biggest child pervert and abuser there is. No, God's a good God. All good things come down from above. Study James. You'll be shocked. And so he left the presence of the Lord, and he smoked Job with all kinds of bulls. And, and, and Job sitting in this mire, taking a piece of a shell and scraping off of him the boils. And I don't know if you ever smell a boil, but it's nasty. And he's scraping them off. His wife turns on God and says, why don't you just curse God and die? You know, nine months later, God appears to him and shows him there was an enemy. And corrects his theology, and now he understands that there's an enemy that was against him. And guess what? God blesses him nine months later with double fold of what he had prior. Well, if God took it away, why would he give it back? No, the enemy stole it. The enemy was the liar. The enemy is the murderer. The enemy was the thief. The enemy was the adversary, not God. Now, turn back with me to 1 Peter. It's amazing, even in the church, how many people blame God for things that he has not done. We need to study the Word of God and find out his fatherhood. He's better than any natural man, it says in Matthew 6. And I think it's Luke either 11 or 12. He's better than any natural man. If you ask him for a stone, I mean an egg, he won't give you a stone. If he asks you for an uh, egg, he won't give you a serpent. And so on and so on. And he said even if you ask him, he'll give you the Holy Ghost. He'll give you the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 5, it says, so what's Satan doing? He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. We see an example of that in Job. Who, who hit Job's sheep and cattle and donkey and killed his kids? wasn't God. 
but there was a challenge made in the realm of the spirit. Now, the word seek there, because your adversary there is roaring lying, walk about seeking, who may devour. Seek there is Satan moves about to get, gather information about you, to investigate you, to examine you, to consider and to deliberate with the spiritual witnesses in high places and to come up with a plan to hit you. He comes up with a military scheme to kill, steal, and destroy you. He comes up with a plan that he thinks you cannot handle. He wants to tear you apart. Isn't that good? The word, that's not good there, but it's terrible. But the word devour there means literally to destroy you. So he's going to investigate your faith. He's going to investigate your spiritual life. He's going to seek what you, why you're seeking that. And he's going to hit you and hit you hard. That's the way it operates. We need to become familiar with this and understand that only we can oppose him. Only we can resist him. Whom we said steadfast. Steadfast there means firmly fixed, not subject to change. You've got to get a hold of the word of God. Only the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you don't stand on the word of God, your emotions will go up and down. Your circumstances will go up and down. Your attitude will go up and down. Everything about you, one day you'll be positive. Next day you'll be negative. Next day you're talking good. Next day you're cussing. You're all over the map. But the word of God stays the same. You need to sow the word of God into your spirit so it becomes the sword of the spirit. This is the only way you're going to come out of your circumstances. The only way you're going to come out of your situation. It's the only thing that's going to turn what's coming against you. You can't beat the enemy on yourself. You just can't. Steadfast in the faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. I'm going to read that to you out of Romans chapter 10. The only way to receive faith of God is by the word of God. The faith of God is equal to the knowledge of God's word. The more you know of God, the more faith you'll have. If you know nothing of the scripture, you have no faith. If you don't plant green beans into your ground, you won't have green beans. If you don't grant... Healing scriptures in your spirit, you won't have the faith to stand against sickness and disease. If you have cares and worries and anxiety constantly hitting your, your life and you don't cast them onto the Lord and have his best interest and plant the word of God in your spirit, you'll continue to have anxiety, worries, and cares. And God can't help you. Only faith of God can help you. Let's look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. That's in the present. It continues to go on and on and on and on. You keep planting that seed into your spirit to the spirit of God in you takes that seed and causes faith to come forth. And then you believe and you have confidence and you have trust in your spirit to step out of that boat and walk on the water, the water of God's word. It's the only way you're going to feed him. So, knowing the same affliction misfortunes everybody in this room walks in the words gonna get hit you're gonna have to learn on your own to find and stand against the misfortunes and the things that hit your life that try to kill still and destroy you you can cry to God all night you can pray you can fast you can get every brother and sister in the world to pray for you but it's not going to change till you get the Word of God in you and you use the sword of your spirit against the enemy that's coming in to crush you to bruise you to destroy you then it goes on are accomplishing your brother that are in the room I'm gonna stop there and finish the rest look at Ephesians chapter 6 I'm running out of time man and Ephesians 6 finally my brother from this day forward be strong in the Lord and the power of his might verse 11 put a whole armor of God and be able to walk, stand against all the mythology of the devil Verse 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not your neighbor that's your problem. It's not your son and daughter that's your problem. It's not your mate that's your problem. It's not your employer that's your problem. <laughs> against principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness, ruled against spiritual weakness, high place to take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. All that in there is resist the same word, stand against the enemy. 
Stand therefore means stand firm that we just read in 1 Peter 5. You have to be firmly set on the Word of God. The Word of God must be in your heart, renewed your mind, and be in your mouth. You have to be set. You have to be firmly set to begin to have victory in your life. Having your Lord's going about with tread, the breastplate with righteousness, preparation of the gospel. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, that you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know what this means? I showed to you that Paul, you know where it says in verse, um, the Lord said to do this. I have two things I wanted to do. Hold on, man. And let's just say James 4 there, 6. He giveth more grace, for it says God receives. Is this the problem? gives grace unto the humble. That's the same thing he said in Peter. The arrow there means that Satan comes up with a scheme and personalizes it just to you. What the enemy will hit my life with will not be the same arrow that hits Brenda's life. Because he knows your weakness. He's investigated you. He's examined you. He's done some research on you. He knows your weaknesses. And he's going to hit you in your weakness. And that's the area you need to take the word of God and keep putting it in your spirit over and over and over so that your spirit becomes strengthened. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You've got to get that faith deep into your spirit. How's faith come? By hearing and hearing the word of God. Now watch what it says here. So the dart that he sent to Paul was to stop his ministry. What was some of those arrows that he sent? I read this to you about three weeks ago. This is taken out of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. God told Paul in the realm of the Spirit that he was going to suffer for the things preaching Christ to the Gentiles. He said Satan's going to, he's going to come up with a plan and throw arrows at you to try to destroy your walk in Christ. Of Jews I received 40 stripes, but one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwrecked night and day. You remember all this. In journeys I had troubles in waters, troubles in robbers, troubles in my own countrymen, troubles by the heathen, troubles in the city, trouble in the wilderness, troubles in the sea, trouble among false brethren. So I'm almost saying one of the arrows that followed Paul was someone of a religious sect would stir up trouble for him, and that's when it all would start. Study his life. The devil never changed his tactic on Paul. <laughs> anyway, I don't have time to do this. In 2 Corinthians 12, what I wanted to show you about grace. In verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'll speak as a fool, but I'll say the truth. But now for barely does any man sink me above that which seeth me to be that heareth of me. Lest I should be exalted. What's exalted? See, you can exalt yourself, but I'd rather the hand of God exalt me. Now watch this. Exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, an arrow of Satan to buffet me that I shouldn't be exalted above measure. I prayed to God three times that it might depart from me. I asked God to take this away from me three times to stop this stuff that's happening to me. In red letter, my grace is sufficient for you. If you humble yourself and put the Word of God into you, that equals the grace of God that you'll have in your life. Grace equals faith equals the knowledge of God's Word. You study it out and will be amazed. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul learned that God's influence, that's what grace means. That if I follow the influence of the Holy Spirit that led me to study a certain scripture, and when that hits my life, I can stand up to it with the sword of the Spirit and defeat it because of the grace of God that he has given me through the word of God. And let me finish Ephesians here because I have one more thing to share and we'll close. He goes on taking the shield of faith which is able to quench all the fire darts of the wicked. Did you ever ask yourself, why do I end up in the same situation over and over and over? That's an error of the devil. So how do I stop something that happens in my life over and over and over and over? How can I break that? I prayed to God. So did Paul. Three times he prayed to God. God said, I'm not changing it. You got to change it. You got to resist it. You got to oppose it. You got to withstand it. 
So through the divine influence of the Holy Spirit led him to the Word of God. He planted that seed into the Spirit till it became faith into him. And then in Ephesians, it goes on and says this, The helmet of your salvation, which is the renewed mind, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the harema of God. Once you keep planting that seed into your spirit about the situation, that arrow that keeps hitting your life, keeps hitting your life, keeps kill, still and destroying, keeps murdering, keeps lying to you, keeps you in a fence state, keeps you in a weak state, keeps you pounding on you and beating you, eventually that word that you keep putting in your spirit, you keep sowing that seed you need into your spirit, it'll rise up in faith and that becomes the sword of the spirit. When the Holy Spirit takes that seed and speaks it and renews your mind to it and you speak it out of your mouth in faith, that's the sword of the spirit. Let me show you. We'll close. Luke chapter 4. Jesus is filled with the Holy Ghost in chapter 3. He has this incredible spiritual experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. In chapter 4 and 18, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach, to teach. He has sent me to heal. He sent me to deliver. He has given me to set the, the captivity free. He, I'm to come to preach liberty to the captives. And you know what else? I was thinking about this Spirit of God just quickening this back to me. I guess the second part of the sermon I won't get to. Because I'm 57.
He put one word in there. He put not and changed the whole thing, God said. Now, Satan takes the word of God, Psalms 91 again, and he twists what Psalms 91 takes. The devil knows the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you're no match for him. Remember, he'll flee from you if you resist him. He's going he's gonna to flee from Jesus here in a moment. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over to keep thee. In his hands thou shalt bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against thy stone. That's perverted from what Psalms 91 says. Jesus answered and said, It is said, it is written, Thou shalt not tempt thy Lord thy God. What did Jesus use against the tactics of what was kill, steal, and destroy him? What was coming against him? What was trying to defeat him? He stood up and quoted the word of God that he had planted in his spirit, renewed his mind to, and he was confident and bold in it, and he quotes it to Satan's faith and tells him, It is written. And what does Satan do? The devil ended all his temptation. He had no more plan. He had to go back up into the spiritual witness of thy place in the second heaven and come up with another scheme. He departed from him for a season. I just wanted to share with you, and I didn't even get halfway through what I wanted to share, but one part I want you to share. If something is coming against you, and it keeps hitting you over and over and over, you say, why do I always end up at the same spot in my life. Why do I constantly seem to fight this thing that constantly hits my life? Find the seed of God that conflicts that because remember adversary means he's going to do the opposite of what the Word of God said. Find the opposite of what Satan's doing to you through the Word of God. Begin to plant that Word into your spirit till it becomes renewed to your mind. In other words, you understand the purpose of that word because the Spirit of God illuminates, enlightens that word to your spirit, and then he's going to speak that seed to you what to do when you speak it out of your mouth like Jesus did. It's the harema of Christu. It's the harema of God. It's the word of God coming out and defeating, bruising the head, crushing Satan's motivation, his M.O. that he's trying to kill, steal, and destroy your life with. And it's the way God's designed it. And so Satan had to leave and come up with another way. And if you don't know which way he did, he got inside the camp and got Judas Iscariot's heart. And Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. But Jesus still didn't get defeated. He still won his battle. Father, I thank you this morning. I'm going to say this is part one of two parts. Father God, we have to recognize that we have an enemy. And that enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. He wants to murder us, wants to lie to us, wants to take us out. God, you don't tempt any man with evil because you can't tempt yourself with it. Everything outside of faith is sin. You, you can't do anything outside of the Word of God. We need to recognize who our enemy is. We need to recognize his schemes and his methodology, his M.O., we need to find the word, the seed, the scriptures that contradict what Satan's trying to do to our life. We need to continue over and over and over, plant that seed into our spirit, like it said in Mark 4, 26 through 29. We need to build that until we get confident and renew our mind and get it in our mouth. And when the enemy comes in one more time and brings that arrow and shoots it into our life, that we'll take the shield of faith, the word of God, the knowledge of God, defend that arrow, and we're going to stand up and speak the word of God. No, Mr. Devil, no more. Because the word of God, it is written. And the word of God, the harema of God, is going to go out and defeat Satan from what he's doing to your life. And your life will begin to change. Father, I thank you. And Father, the deeper we get into the things of the word and the spirit here, the more he's going to try to hit. If we're prepared for those hits, if we're prepared for the mythology of Satan, we build ourselves up in the Word of God, which is Jesus. We renew our mind to the Word of God. We know what the Word of God said because the Spirit of God quickened it to us. And when the enemy comes like he did to you, Jesus, we will stand up and say, it is written, it is written, it is written. And I thank you, Father God, that when that power of your Word goes out in faith, 
It will absolutely destroy the plans of Satan. It will absolutely destroy his plan, his will. What he's seeking to devour, to destroy me with, will absolutely be destroyed. And the abundance of life will rise up into my spirit, through my mind and soul, into my body, into my physical life. I thank you, Father God, that you create us to walk in victory and triumph. You never create us to be defeated and walk in the burdens of life and the defeat of, of life itself. You made us to live in the same life that Christ walked in and that Christ that wa he walked in as wisdom and power of God that made him successful and victorious in every situation. It made him triumph in Christ. I thank you, Father God, that we're going to learn in this church to rise up in our circumstances, to rise up in our family life, to rise up in our job life, to rise up in our community life. We're going to rise up in the Word of God and be strong because it is written. We're going to believe it. We're going to speak it. And we're going to begin to see God. You yourself begin to take care of Satan and he's going to flee from us trying to find a place to hide from the power of your Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.